ordinary friends and acquaintances and be replaced, even in time, forgotten. But there is no one to replace Helena Petrovna, nor can she ever be forgotten. My dear friend died at 2.25 p.m. on Friday, sitting in her big armchair, her head supported by faithful Laura Cooper. If you need to know about H.P. Blavatsky, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask. I'm certain the Colonel or Mr. Judge will probably tell you a great deal more about her work than an ordinary theosophist like me. On the other hand, they probably won't know the little details of her everyday life, or certainly her last few days, as I do. It was my privilege to be with HPB during her last illness, and at the moment of her death. In 1831, in the southern Russian province of Ekaterinslov, a daughter was born to the wife of Colonel Peter von Hahn. They named her Helena Petrovna. With her younger sister, she was raised mainly by her grandparents in an environment of Western sophistication, mixed with superstition and the popular Russian beliefs in spirits, witchcraft and magical customs and rites. Along with her growing love of music, from an early age she began to show signs of psychic abilities which developed with her affinity for the love of nature around her. I have to admit, I used to enjoy frightening my little sister with tales of fearsome monsters and elemental creatures. I would turn my grandmother's collection of stuffed animals into a dark jungle of predators and fear. I was provoked into marriage. The family always said nobody would ever want me. I was too headstrong, too irresponsible to escape their control and thinking I would have more freedom as a married woman, I accepted an army general named Blavatsky. I never consummated the marriage. And after three disastrous months, I left him and Russia. She went in search of occult knowledge. In North America, she lived with Red Indian tribes. She traveled through Greece, Egypt and other parts of Europe. She even joined Garibaldi's army and was wounded at the Battle of Mentana. Then, on a visit to London in 1851, she at last met with a teacher whom she had only seen in visions when she was a child. He was a master of the wisdom, a Mahatma, who was to change the entire course of her life. Mahatmas were, were and still are, uh, a, group of, a group of people who have, uh, through enormous self-discipline, mastered the essential nature of being human. They are, if you will, perfected men, though some of them would claim that, that uh, even that term, perfected, is a relative term and that there is more to be achieved. Yet, relative to our stage of evolution, they are, they, ha they are perfected men. Now, the Mahatmas are really an extension of the consciousness that we experience as self-conscious beings. If, as in her concept, consciousness slumbers in the material realms, becomes sentient in the plant and the animal kingdoms, becomes self-conscious in human beings as self-identity, self-awareness, in the Mahatmas, the extrapolation is it becomes supraconscious. That is, you become aware of your relationship to the source of your own existence, to consciousness per se. So the Mahatmas represent the evolutionary spearhead of humanity, and that we're all, she argues, moving forward into that domain of human experience and understanding. 
In 1874, her master sent her back to the United States, where there was an increasing interest in the occult. She said she was sent to the United States to gather about her a group who would recognize brotherhood as a key objective, who would be open to the study of Eastern and Western uh, literature, knowledge, uh, the best philosophies of both. And she goes on to say, uh, we were not told what to do, but we were told what not to do. <laughs> a very interesting statement. So when she came, she thought it was perhaps through the spiritualist movement that this impulse of the exposition of the esoteric philosophy was to be given. But the spiritualists soon turned against her because they wanted only phenomena. America was ghost crazy, and Blavatsky found that seances were a frequent occurrence in most major cities, but she disagreed profoundly with what they thought they were experiencing. She was saying that uh, uh, where you uh, communicate, sometimes it's most certainly not with the departed. Uh, she would say, I don't fully agree with this, but this is what she said, that it's with uh, this sort of residuum that, that she called an, an astral shell, a sort of uh, record uh, of the memories. And uh, uh, I think that is the major reason why the spiritualists didn't like it. They thought they were uh, getting direct communications from the departed, standing there in their astral body, just like uh, we are here in the physical world, uh, speaking in their ordinary voice, presumably, and the medium hearing this with her clear audience and passing it all on to the sitter. Madame Levatsky said, it's not like that at all. It was ghastly to watch seances. It often made me sick to see the materializations and the welcome given to them by the spiritualists. They wept and rejoiced around the medium clothed in these empty shadows sometimes broke down with emotion, a sincere joy and happiness that made my heart bleed for them. The more I see of mediums, the more I see the danger surrounding humanity. Poets speak of the thin partition between this world and the next. They are blind. There is no partition at all, except the difference of states in which the living and the dead exist and the grossness of the physical senses of the majority of mankind. Now, HBB uh, had to give out a message to the then spiritualists, which explained the phenomena in quite another way. Uh, she would not have it under any circumstances that the real spirit of man could ever revisit the earth after a person was dead. Now, that offended the uh, spiritualists a lot, but they couldn't accept her explanation. And her explanation was that man is essentially uh, dual, uh, the personality being one level of being, and the other was his uh, spiritual being, spiritual nature. The personality, under certain circumstances, could come back and uh, converse through mediums with the living. But the circumstances were special, uh, depending on when the person died, how old they were when they died, their connection with the earth, a whole lot of variable factors. But when once in the after-death processes, the spiritual man had withdrawn from the vehicles that it occupied during life, the ordinary personal man, then there was no coming back at all of any kind. It was during her pursuit of genuine spirit phenomena that she was to meet a Civil War colonel, Henry Olcott, who would become her lifelong friend and associate. They met in, uh, in the United States, in Chittenden, Vermont, where he uh, had gone as a reporter for the Daily, New York Daily Graphic uh, to see what were these phenomena that were taking place. And uh, she went there uh, because she heard of the phenomena of the Eddy brothers and that is where they met. I must confess that when I first saw her, I thought her the most singular person. In fact, I recall remarking to Alfred Cap, rather rudely, I guess, good, good gracious, look at that specimen, will you? 
She made such a contrast to the drab farmhouse around her in her scarlet Gary Baldy shirt. I knew she had to be foreign. Well, hearing her speak perfect French to her companion, I thought her Parisian, for we knew all kinds of odd things came out of Paris. There was something about her, imperious, yet at the same time sympathetic. You know, one of my hobbies was reading character from faces, and she had a masterful face, full of power. Yet there was refinement and culture in it, too. I followed her into the Eddie Garden. She rolled herself a cigarette and was searching for her matches when I took the opportunity to make her acquaintance. Permettez-moi, madame, I said. I lit her cigarette. We began to converse in French. She told me she was deeply interested in the phenomena described in the Daily Graphic. Even so, she had hesitated about coming. I had no idea who he was. I told him I was afraid this, this, this Colonel Olcott might drag me into one of his articles. You need have no fear on that score, madame, I told her. He won't mention you unless you permit it. I can assure you of that because I am Henry Olcott. <laughs> she laughed, unembarrassed, and introduced herself. It was the first time I'd heard that name that was to become so potent and important a factor in my life. Olcott had become convinced that these spiritualistic phenomena ought to be much better known and written up and investigated because of the immense comfort that they gave to the people who were present and got messages from their, maybe their children, maybe their parents or whoever. This really indicated to them that there was survival after death. The whole thing here is made plain. The spiritualism she was sent to America to profess and ultimately bring to replace the cruder Western mediumism was Eastern spiritualism. You see, the one thing necessary for the age was to check materialistic skepticism and to strengthen the spiritual basis of religious yearning. Therefore, the battle being joined, she took her stand beside the American spiritualists and, for the moment, made common cause with them. Spiritualism in the hands of an adept becomes magic because he is learned in the art of blending together the laws of the universe without breaking any of them and thereby violating nature. In the hands of an inexperienced medium, spiritualism becomes unconscious sorcery for he opens unknowingly a door of communication between two worlds through which emerge the blind forces of nature working in the astral light as well as good and bad spirits. It is theosophy, which is the true spiritualism. The modern scheme of that name, as now practiced by the masses, is simply transcendental materialism. The origins of theosophy can, really can be considered in two lights. There's the origin of modern theosophy, which is where Madame Blavatsky comes in, in 1875 and onwards, uh, with the birth of the modern theosophical movement. Uh, but theosophy as a term predated Madame Blavatsky and can be traced back to Neoplatonic times. So uh, there has been a tradition of what we can call theosophy or the ancient wisdom, um, from that time onward, yeah, the ancient wisdom, of course, as a, as a concept, goes back even further than that, well, to the beginnings of time, if you will. Uh, as far as human records go, there, ha there is evidence that there was a teaching. One of the books from which I quote most freely is Aldous Huxley's Perennial Philosophy. And he uses two terms which are applicable here. He says uh, that this philosophy is universal and immemorial. It goes back as far as the records of the human race and uh, it is universal in every part of the world wherever there has been a recognizable civilization there has been a teaching which is uh, so which certainly shows certain aspects of the theosophical thought. The idea of the unity of life. The fact that there is 
a spiritual something, to put it no more than that, a spiritual something which is the foundation of life. On returning to New York, Olcott introduced Blavatsky to his friend William Quan Judge, a fellow lawyer, and it was proposed that a society should be formed to express and further these ancient wisdoms and diffuse information about them. They also wished to reconcile all the antagonisms between spiritualists and materialists. The constitution was drafted and the Theosophical Society formed on the 17th of November, 1875. In one place, she says that the society was to be established on grounds similar to the American Republic. And I think that's one reason Colonel Alcott was chosen, because from the very beginning, he was, of course, fully familiar with a democratic system, a constitutional form of government. When they formed the society, he was elected as the first president of it, and he helped to draw up the rules and constitution of the new society. And one sees in that how he made use of his legal knowledge and of his association with uh, Freemasonry. Annie Besant once made the statement, H.P. Uh, Blavatsky gave theosophy to the world. H.S. Alcott gave the Theosophical Society, which was the greater gift. It's an interesting statement because uh, she was not an organizer. She was not organized in herself. She was the teacher. She was the one to convey the wisdom. Although struggling as ever with the problems of too little money and trying to get the society established, in 1875, Madame Blavatsky settled down to write her first great work, Isis Unveiled and with the help of Olcott, Judge and others, it was published in 1877. HPB did something I think that people don't fully appreciate. It, uh, what she did was quite unique in the world of literature. She made a resume of all the old classical traditional knowledge of this subject that had ever been in the world or written up in books. And she went to the trouble of finding all the old scriptures, all the old systems of philosophy, all the old religions, and all the great sages. And she somehow or another acquired a knowledge of what they said and put it all together. The main part of these teachings, these philosophies, was of course Eastern. India, in the late 1870s, was a vast and fascinating world of contradictions, where the ancient East met the Western influences of the British Raj. Blavatsky and Olcott travelled extensively around the subcontinent to promote interest in her great work. They eventually established in the south at Adya, near Madras, the headquarters for the Theosophical Society. At a time when India was simply the back hole of Calcutta or Sati or infanticide, they saw a vision of India, they saw the magic of India, they saw beyond the poverty and filth that we still hear today, they saw the thing that drew people and still draws people from the Beatles down to any person who comes today, that magic, that magic that still exists in India. And I think this is why the society also still has a headquarters in India that from here I think more than anything else she contributed to the image of India in a remarkable way in the sense that India not just the country or locality but India in the sense of a, a state of mind. Lavatsky was developing a reputation for producing astounding psychic phenomena. In an empty room bells would ring, furniture move, most importantly, letters written to her and her associates by the masters were apported. I found it difficult to understand at first how someone who was attacked by the spiritualist of whom she so disapproved could at the same time herself receive phenomena. You can't really discuss H.P. Blavatsky without the phenomena. She did produce phenomena. Again, she pointed to the fact that this was not her chief aim, but it 
it did gain the attention of the world. Well, she hoped that by demonstrating these faculties that she would inspire people with interest to explore the teachings and the ideas that she sought to propagate to, to humankind. She found that people, when presented with phenomenon, were simply excited by that and they didn't seek to go any further. That's a great pity. So she really turned away from that. I think uh, from those who were around her at the time, they had no doubt that she was very capable. But this fact alone put her in the midst of controversy, controversy that was to, in, in a way, work against her altruistic mission, which was to teach man about the spiritual science and about man's latent capabilities that he could draw, draw upon. So it worked for those around her, but it became a two-edged sword. Yes, I think her, there's plenty of evidence that she did some amazing things that would excite the parapsychologists of today. But it didn't serve the purpose to which she hoped, which was to draw people towards the understanding and the questions, the great questions that man has always asked. What am I? What is it about human nature that can make these phenomena possible? With such important questions to address, why did Blavatsky persist with something that brought such criticism? <laughs> oh, she was so stubborn. Yet she was closer to me than any blood sister, as though we had always known one another. Though as unlike in temperaments and abilities as any two people could be, and often disagreeing radically in matters of detail, we were of one mind and heart regarding the work. And in our reverent allegiance to the teachers and masters, the overseers and planners of that work. I loved her for the other, higher self, which was also the most mysterious. Seeing us together, anyone would have said I had her fullest confidence. Yet the fact is that despite all the years of closeness in daily work, she was as much an enigma to me as to the others. In fact, the phenomena were not totally counterproductive. As she had originally hoped, they did attract some influential people like A.P. Sinnott. He had a unique position as the editor of an influential periodical uh, in India at the time, The Pioneer. And he had the ear of the educated European community in India at the time. He was ideally placed to act as a go-between, so to speak, between HBB and the masters that she, was, you know, she represented and the European community both in India and back in England. But Sinnott's intellect was also a barrier, causing him sometimes to accept the material, yet to doubt the spiritual. In short, to doubt Blavatsky herself. My dear Sinnott, do you believe that because you have fathomed as you think my physical crust and brain, you have ever penetrated even the first cuticles of my real self? You would gravely err if you did. I am held by some as untruthful, because till now I have shown the world only the exterior Madame Blavatsky. It is like complaining of the falseness of a moss and weed covered muddy stony rock for writing outside, I am not moss covered and mud plastered. Your eyes deceive you, for you are unable to see beneath the crust. You must understand the allegory. It is not boasting, for I do not say whether inside that unprepossessing rock there is a palatial residence or a humble hut. What I say is this, you do not know me, for whatever there is inside, it is not what you think it is. And to judge me, therefore, as untruthful, is the greatest mistake in the world, besides being a flagrant injustice. I, the real inner I, am in prison and cannot show myself as I am, however much I desire to. Sinnott uh, had a, room, a background as a spiritualist. Um, he was expecting things of a spiritualistic character at that time materializations, phenomena, and so forth. And again, she certainly caught his attention by doing just exactly that. Um, the initial phenomena that she presented to him uh, were all of that nature. 
uh, raps on tables and windows where nobody physically was present. Uh, you know, these sorts of, uh, sorts of phenomena. Later on, uh, the famous incident where a cup was produced when they were having a picnic and uh, uh, they, they, uh, an extra guest turned up unexpectedly and they said, oh, can we have another cup? And the phenomena was to produce a cup which actually duplicated the, the set that they had physically present at the time. And yeah, it was all very dramatic and they had to dig through the earth and through the roots of a tree in order to find this cup, and there it was. But ultimately, what does that prove? And he was always searching out more proof of whatever the physical phenomena were, whether it was uh, uh, producing taps and raps and so forth in the extraordinary places, or later, the production of letters, for instance, from the Mahatmas, which were materialized before his eyes. The Mahatma let's say, uh, sits down to dictate a letter. And first of all, in his mind's eye, he composes the letter, uh, so let's say a page at a time. So he's composed a page and he's now written it with his mind's eye. Now he has to copy that through this process of precipitation. And what he does then is to draw materials from the psychic world around him, which flesh out that archetype that he has created. And so if you think of the analogy of um, a magnet with a magnetic field and iron filings, you probably get uh, as good an image as you're going to get. He has created the, the archetype, the pattern, the shape, and now he's using substance around him, rather like we would sprinkle iron filings on a, on a piece of paper to show magnetic lines of force, to fill out or flesh out the the actual thing itself. So in that way, then it's translated from the world of ideas into the world of forms and into the final and into the physical world in that uh, multi-stage process. Well, there's something physically rather strange with them, I think. The ink of the period normally used to get very, very black and then gradually fade to brown, right out to yellow with age. This hasn't. The paper is also very thin and curious enough, uh, the ink hasn't um, gone through to the reverse side of the paper to any extent. Um, normally ink on this thin paper, you know, go, it runs rather straight through, and uh, uh, particularly modern inks. This hasn't. It strikes me as very strange, and also the, um, there are a number of questions about those documents I would dearly love to answer, but they would need um, laboratory examination. Whether they were precipitated in by some miraculous telegraph, I, I just don't, uh, uh, I don't know. So the letters have two significances. Firstly, that they were written at all, uh, which shows that there was uh, a body of men who were independent of Madame Blavatsky who wrote them. And the second is that the ideas in which they contained. Now, the ideas uh, are more in the nature of a teaching guide. It's not so much the information that they present, um, as another of the recipients uh, said on one occasion, um, if I were to reproduce all the teachings that we have received, I, I could tell you the whole lot in the space of a day, and this after a year or so. The point was that the letters were a teaching mechanism, not a form of trying to present ideas. And they have to be seen very much in terms of a teaching method, and to try and educate Sinnott try and evoke his inner, inner perception of the meanings of the teachings. But there were soon to be even more injustices and serious misreadings of her character. Madame Lubetsky had befriended uh, the husband and wife, uh, Monsieur and Madame Coulon. Uh, she met them in uh, Cairo, I believe, and she befriended them and, uh, and took them to Adyar and he was a sort of uh, handyman, and, and she did uh, work for Madame Lubetsky too. When they came to Madras, it seems that Madame Coulomb had tried to borrow a, a large sum of money from one of the Indian princes, and Madame Blavatsky had thwarted this. And just before leaving for India, she told Madame Blavatsky's servant that uh, she would ruin her. Uh, it seems that Madame Blavatsky actually wanted to get rid of the Coulombs because uh, when they were finally dismissed when Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott were away in 1884. She simply telegraphed them uh, saying, sorry, you go prosper. Now, I've 
someone has incriminating letters, you certainly are not so nonchalant knowing that this person has the goods on you. She found that they were doing certain uh, improper things, uh, fraudulent things, and she sacked them. And, uh, uh, but before they went, um, certain theosophists believe that they did one or two things to queer her pitch. Madame Lubatsky had a, a sort of cabinet in which letters were supposed to appear uh, from uh, these Mahatmas. They appear to have cut a hole uh, between this cabinet uh, and uh, a wardrobe which was in Madame Blavatsky's room, the other side of the, uh, the wall. The cabinet was in the so-called shrine room. Uh, and of course, uh, it looked as though Madame Blavatsky had been putting these uh, ostensibly paranormally acquired letters from the Mahatmas through this hole, uh, which would, of course, uh, have been fraudulent. Although these attempts to discredit her did not damage the society directly, the claims of the Coulombs coincided with an investigation on behalf of the Society for Psychical Research by Richard Hodgson, who, on completing his less than thorough inquiries, decided she was a fraud. Hodgson report relies on one chief key witness, Emma Coulomb, who was a hostile witness. She'd been fired from uh, the Theosophical headquarters uh, for bad conduct. She had sworn to get even with uh, Blavatsky, which she did, uh, but that makes her a very suspect witness anyhow. Uh, but then there was a question of the handwriting evidence. Um, that uh, Hodgson went into in quite con uh, considerable detail with um, an expert called Nethercliffe. And I did have to examine the actual documents and the claims that were, that were made, the comparison was made uh, by Hodgson himself. And I think I managed to demonstrate um, the falsity of these, uh, these claims. Anybody who's read the, uh, the Secret Doctrine and certain other publications of Madame Lubatsky would would think it was almost ridiculously laughable to think that somebody who could write something like that was fraudulent. The SPR is not supposed to have a collective view, but in fact, uh, the Hodgson report had the effect of stifling any further discussion of Madame Blavatsky, a phenomenal work or anything else, uh, for nearly a hundred years. And in fact, it seemed to have become the policy of the SPR not to publish anything at all um, about her. I think if Hodgson could have um, considered the possibility that some of Blavatsky's witnesses were telling the truth, and Emma Kula might have been lying, he'd have given much fairer uh, reports and uh, wouldn't have had this, um, you say, devastating effect on, the, uh, on history. Blavatsky, outraged, wanted to sue for slander. But the society committee would not support her, and she was dissuaded by Olcott for her own sake. She left India on March the 31st, 1885, never to return. The memory of HPB is by no means forgotten in this place. Although she lived here for a very short time, I think the imprint of all that she said and did still remains very strongly here. Uh, so. Adyar, I think, will always be regarded as the home which uh, uh, HPB loved very much in India. Because HPB felt forced to leave India, she came to England and it was here that she produced her most enduring work. Now, free from Indian influence, she was very widely read. She became a teacher in her own right and she produced the secret doctrine, the voice of silence, the key to theosophy, uh, innumerable articles, all of which I think are of permanent value. And it may be that one of these disasters that come along in life, and seem to be tragic, have a purpose in the end, and you look back and think, well, perhaps it's the best thing that's happened. Yes, Master gave me a choice that I might die and be free if I choose, or I could live and finish the secret doctrine. He told me how great would be my sufferings and what a terrible time I would have before me. Uh, 
And don't let the fire go out. These old bones will freeze. But when I thought of those students whom I would be permitted to teach, and of the Theosophical Society in general, to which I have already given my heart's blood, I accepted the sacrifice. And get me some coffee and something to eat. And find my infernal tobacco box. She had outbursts of anger, yes, of uh, losing her patience, and of great distress, great distress also at some of the things that were said against her. And also she was extremely distressed by the way in which the names of her teachers were being dragged into the public press. She obviously had uh, tremendous personal difficulties, put it that way, physical suffering, illness, and so on. And there are, of course, the stories that the master told us about her not being a complete being even. So when she left Tibet after she'd had this occult instruction, she had to leave one or part of her, one of her principles behind. And this was one that would, had she been a complete being, have enabled her to control herself very much better than she could. So uh, they make this uh, the excuse for her being irascible and uh, uh, very sharp-tempered at times. But all the people, as far as I know, and this from reading the uh, obituary notices about her, uh, forgave her all that uh, edge of her tongue that she <laughs> subjected them to because they knew inherently that she was cons kind, understanding, sympathetic, and they loved her for what she was. There's uh, something which I think is attributed to Walt Whitman when he was speaking to a correspondent. Uh, he said, what you are speaks so loudly I cannot hear what you say. And I think that's a perfect... Uh, illustration of HPB, what she did, um, it far outweighs anything that she might have, uh, might have been accused of. So why did the Masters choose her? In one of the famous letters from the Mahatmas to Mr. Sinnott, they indicated that they had searched for nearly a century to find a vehicle that was suitable to send out into the world to convey this inner knowledge. In one sense, she was like a, a transformer in, uh, in electrical terms. To step down that energy or that uh, wisdom, that illumination, uh, which is Mahatmic, if you like to put it that way. Uh, in, and they said that she was not the best, but the best available. Her life, as I have known it these past 17 years, has been a tragedy. The tragedy of a martyr philanthropist. Selfless, giving herself freely to her work and the spiritual welfare of humanity, she's been hounded by slanderers and bigots. Laura, my dear, to my judges, past, present, and future, I have nothing to say. But I tell you, we are living in an age of prejudice and paradox, always struggling between our honest convictions and fear of that cruelest of tyrants, public opinion. Give me my pen. I will write that down. But how is popularity to be acquired? Very easily indeed. How with the walls, reverence mediocrities in public favor, shut your eyes to any Truth unpalatable to the leaders of the social herd. Bow low before vulgarity and power and bray loud applause to the rising donkey who kicks a dying lion, now a fallen idol. Here's amazing, the shallow falsehoods that have been circulated against her. Among them, perhaps the wickedest of charges of immorality. Well, if ever there was a sexless being, it was she. Nor has she ever, in all the years I've known her, drunk any kind of liquor. An incessant smoker, true, strong language and eccentric to a degree in most things of a conventional nature. But neither thief, harlot, drunkard, 
nor any of a dozen other criminal things she's been recklessly accused of by a set of scurvy writers unfit to clean her shoes. She was a channel to teachings of the Mahatmas, which she argued were real people, real identities, and she was a channel for that wisdom within herself, which she sought to ground and to put into literary terms, and she was a channel for the information within nature itself, recorded in what she would call the Akashic realms, nature's indelible memory. So she could pick and choose her sources and use that to construct her thesis called The Secret Doctrine. These pages are not written for the masses. They are neither an appeal for reform nor an effort to win over to our view the fortunate of life. They are addressed solely to those who are constitutionally able to comprehend them, to those who suffer, to those who hunger and thirst after some reality in this world of Chinese shadows. Every atom has life in it, however latent and unconscious, and moreover is a little universe endowed with unconsciousness, hence with memory. Everything in the universe is alive. Consciousness is contained in all matter, and both the seed and the speck must have the latent potentialities in them. For the reproduction and gradual development the unfolding of the thousand and one forms or phases of evolution. Hence, the future plan, if not a design, must be there. Her reason for writing The Secret Doctrine was to represent wisdom that had been around for many centuries, to try and gather together, to synthesize what she calls the perennial tradition into modern culture, to reintegrate old ideas with the new, now, she was dealing with a, a culture that was dogmatic, not only in their theological thinking, but also in their scientific thinking, in that they had got to a point where they believed there was nothing really more to find in science. There was no major discovery just around the corner. The time she was writing The Secret Doctrine in, in the late 1880s uh, was before the atom had been split, before uh, any of the modern theories of subatomic particles and quantum physics had, uh, had been expounded at all. And at that time, she was already saying that the essential nature of matter was energy uh, and that anything, uh, you know, the appearance of, of solidity associated with the atom was an illusion. And I, I think that was entirely prophetic. But when you acknowledge that the atom is divisible, then you can disassemble and re-aggregate matter. And matter and energy being ident identical, different forms of each other, was a notion that she had and was prevalent to the whole ancient tradition, a notion that was only validated by Einstein's work. So she had a whole set of concepts, not in specific detail, but she knew that the materialistic age was due to end in due course. Cosmologists uh, accept a model of our physical universe which is based on the laws of physics primarily. And uh, although that model is changing and being updated continuously, it is primarily a physical model. Madame Blavatsky would regard the, the universe primarily from a spiritual point of view. I use spiritual here in the sense of uh, essences and laws and processes, the fact that the universe is a living whole and so forth, and that the physical universe that we now see is an outgrowth, is a final manifestation of those inner spiritual living processes. In my book, The Rebirth of Nature, I show how modern science is now leading us back to a sense of the life of nature. We now see the cosmos as like a developing organism again. It's not like a machine running out of steam. It starts with the Big Bang. It's like the hatching of the cosmic egg. And the uh, cosmos has been growing and developing ever since. Gaia, the Earth, is seen once again as Mother Earth, a living organism. Again, a very ancient view that's come back in a very modern scientific form. Fields and the field theories uh, of science are now reanimating nature, giving a sense again of the invisible organizing principles of the world. 
And uh, through the theory of chaos, we've now, um, and quantum indeterminism, we've now recovered a sense of the spontaneity and freedom of nature. And through the evolutionary theories of Darwin and now of cosmic evolution, uh, we have a sense of creativity in all nature. This is nothing like the old mechanical clockwork universe of the 17th century. It's more like the old ideas of a living world. And of course, um, theosophical thinking, like all traditional thinking, is based on the idea of a living cosmos, not on the idea of a dead machine. So there's a curious way in which modern science is transcending the mechanistic worldview and leading us back to a sense of living nature. It's interesting to compare two descriptions of the cosmos, one given by Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine, and the other given by Robert Jastrow, who was director of the Institute of Space Studies. I quote from his book, picture the radiant splendor of the moment of creation. Suddenly a world of pure energy flashes into being. Unimaginable brightness fills the universe. Now compare this with a statement made by Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine. Darkness radiates light, and behold, unparalleled refulgent glory, bright space, son of dark space. So here she was, painting a picture of the beginnings of the cosmos, which we find direct parallels with modern literary scenarios of the coming into being of our cosmos. More things were shown me than have ever been written about. So is it any wonder that all the humbugging tales of her so-called trickery failed to shake my knowledge of her true psychical powers, she showed me the realities of transcendental chemistry and physics, the marvelous dynamic potencies of the human mind, will, and soul. Madame Blavatsky has some very controversial theories concerning the evolution, physical evolution of man. The current theory is that physical man is derived from a common stock with the higher apes and in turn that those that that common stock derives from earlier ape-like stocks and so forth back through the mammals and to reptiles and so forth her theories diverge from that quite substantially but before you can explain that you have to say that uh, she regards man as uh, both spiritual uh, psychic or intellectual and physical, so a threefold, let's say, division as far as that's concerned. Now, man spiritually pre-existed any physical manifestation that we now see. The processes of physical evolution uh, start with projecting a prototype or a template or an image of what is to be physical man into the physical world at a, some far distant point in the evolution of the world. Interestingly, what she says is that all of the placental mammal evolution that we see on the globe today is as a result of that template which was projected into the physical world for the benefit of producing physical man at a later stage. Now, uh, the mammalian forms that we see are so many offshoots from that which became physical uh, much earlier than man did. So although it's tempting to think that uh, because the mammals became physical earlier than man did that they are his progenitors, HPB's uh, idea says no, that's not the case at all. What came first was the prototype. What came next was the physical stocks from which the mammals were developed and what came last was the, uh, the physical stock from which man is developed. But uh, that, uh, as it happens, uh, it's interesting that um, just because something happens earlier, it doesn't necessarily cause what came later. So just because physical man comes later than physical mammals, it doesn't necessarily mean that they caused physical man and his form. Tempting though that might be to think. Theosophy, by virtue of its inherent nature, does not seek to make dogmatic statements about how you should act in any one context. That's one of its beauties. What it does do is to present a vision of reality that can inform any cognitive individual in how they would respond 
to any of these crises. It is not therefore prescriptive, rather it presents you with a framework in which you may draw inspiration. It gives you a vision of reality that is full of hope, altruism and perspective. And yes, I suppose the ecological framework is one way in which that is being worked out. But that is one facet alone of a much wider process. And Lovatsky, in her times, tried to, to draw man to investigate that potential, to lead him out of the highly materialistic framework in which he was in, what the Hindus call the Kali Yuga, the age of materialism, in to the golden age where man may realize his nature may employ that harmoniously with other forms of life. And indeed, in the, in the, again, Hindu calls this the Golden Age. She was the grandmother of the New Age movement. But where did this information actually come from? She says, <clears throat> in a number of places, that she got it in from some realm of being which she calls the astral light. It's like the universal memory. Anything that has ever happened anywhere uh, in the cos cosmos, or certainly on this world, is stored in that astral light. Now, she used to say that on occasions, the master, her master, her teacher, used to provide the references that she wanted and show them to her, and all she had to do was to copy them out. But whatever the form and format of the work, it still required tremendous will, energy and focus, not just to do it, but also to just stay alive. Now the vicissitudes and prodigious amounts of sheer hard labor were finally taking their toll. Even with her strong will and the support of the masters, by April 1891, she had little physical strength left to resist any illness. I should mention it had always been her custom to roll a few cigarettes for Dr. Manel when he called. Throughout her last illness, she never failed to have some ready. Though, as she grew weaker, we sometimes had to roll them instead. But one bad thing was that she herself, from the first days of her illness, lost all desire for smoking. When the fever was over, she tried to begin again, but it gave her no pleasure. She eventually stopped trying. No, she knew the bitterness and sadness of physical life well enough. Often telling me that her true existence only began at night, when she put her body to sleep and went out of it to the master. Often sitting and watching her across the table when she was away from her body, and then when she returned from her soul flight and resumed occupancy, as you might say, when she was away, the body was like a darkened house. When she was there, it was as though the windows were brilliantly lit within. Anyone who has not seen this change can never understand why the mystic calls his physical body a shadow. She marched firmly through the minefield of conflict between spirituality and church. We are accustomed to say to the Buddhists, to the Mohammedan, the Hindu or the Parsi, the road to theosophy lies for you through your own religion. We say this because those creeds possess a deeply philosophical and esoteric meaning, explanatory of the allegories under which they are presented to their people. But we cannot say the same things to Christians. The successors of the apostles never recorded the secret doctrine of Jesus, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven referred to in Mark 4:11. These have been suppressed, destroyed, what have come down the stream of time are the parables, fables, which Jesus expressly intended for the spiritually deaf and blind, and which modern Christianity either takes literally or interprets to the fancy of the fathers of the secular church. So that now Christianity has no esoteric foundation known to those who profess it. In almost every point, the doctrine of the churches and the practices of Christians are in direct opposition to the teachings of Jesus. It is useless, therefore, to try and convince such minds. 
if they are unable or unwilling to study even the broad general idea contained in the term karma, how can they comprehend the fine distinctions involved in the doctrine of reincarnation? Karma is the sum total of our acts, both in the present life and in the preceding births. Thus, it is simply action, cause and effect. It is our actions, thoughts and deeds which guide the karmic law instead of being guided by it. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. There is an inner individuality and there is an outer personality. Now we say that the inner individuality, which is the essence of the person, persists from one life to the next, to the next, to the next. It's therefore misleading to say, oh, I have lived several times before or many times before, because it's not true from a theosophical point of view. Adam Walkup has never lived before. The indwelling individuality, which, uh, through which, which is, is expressed through Adam Walkup, uh, has lived through other personalities many times before. But uh, this, this personality has never lived before. Uh, how does that individuality come about? Well, it is the accumulation of the experiences of innumerable personal lives. As we go through each personal life, we cull from it uh, the worthwhile experience, the skills that we've learned, the knowledge that we have acquired, and so forth. And we distill, if you will, from each personal life all that was of what Plato would call the good, the true, and the beautiful. And that accumulated experience goes to form the spiritual individuality of which I was just talking. Thus, over time, that spiritual individuality has a wealth of experience, skills, knowledge, insight, wisdom, on which individual personalities can draw from time to time. So when we see genius, when we see inspiration, when we see, see abnormal skills and so forth, what we are seeing is the the individual personality, the personality of this life, tapping into the sea of knowledge and experience which is held in that spiritual individuality. She was never the easiest of patients. In her last few days, though feeling very ill, she must have her chair brought to her bedside so as to change position, and then she would decide to go to the sofa. She had to be told everything that was going on, and when she heard that another member of the society had also, like her, been taken ill with influenza, she insisted that he too was nursed at headquarters. Did you know she'd always had a habit of moving one foot when she was concentrating? Strange, she continued that movement almost to the last moment. Yes, she was very, very strong-willed. But I think this was uh, very much part of her occult training, that in order to achieve what she did, in order to be fit to do the work that she did, uh, she had to become entirely uh, her own person, and that what happened in and around her had to be as a result of her will, and not as a result of being a passive medium and al allowing things to happen to her. She describes the processes uh, through which she went uh, in her life as moving from mediumship, from being a medium to being a, what she called a mediator, uh, somebody who's consciously in control of the processes uh, within herself and of the psychic world, rather than being a passive subject to those forces and influences. The day before she died, in spite of her brave efforts, it was very apparent she was suffering intensely and only her powerful will was sustaining her. But she must still have her card table and her armchair. She tried to play patience. Her dear face was pitiful to see as she tried to behave as normal. She fought so hard simply to breathe. I was privy to no momentous last words. Those of any importance had been spoken in the early hours when 
thinking that my sister was nursing her, as she had done at Adya, she said, Isabel, keep the link unbroken. Do not let my last incarnation be a failure. That must have cost her such effort. H.P.B.'s enthusiasm was a flame at which all our theosophists lit their torches, an example which stirred one's blood like the sound of a war trumpet. It is no wonder that I have loved her as a friend, prized her as a teacher, and forevermore keep her memory sacred. Living, I might quarrel with her, but dead, I can only mourn her irreparable loss. I sat beside her with one arm round her, supporting her head. So quietly did she finally slip away that I hardly knew the second she stopped breathing. And then a great sense of peace filled the room. She was an extravagant, colourful, um, controversial personality. And it's, it's possible to say that without those qualities, many of the things she did and said might have been forgotten. But clearly... Ma chiaramente c'è un'enorme quantità di insegnamenti e di idee che cento anni più tardi trovano ancora applicazione nella nostra società. Essere capaci di sedersi è semplicemente scrivere su qualunque argomento immaginabile e scrivere, scrivere e ancora scrivere, e far sì che i propri lavori sopravvivano alla prova dei secoli. Infatti, anche i grandi scrittori di letteratura sono scomparsi, mentre lei è diventata un fenomeno mondiale. Non lo faceva per il beneficio di se stessa, o di tipi come me o te, ma lo faceva per il beneficio di tutta l'umanità. Ed ecco qui la parte messianica. Se solo le razze umane, gli esseri umani, le nazioni, i gruppi di persone avessero preso nota di ciò che diceva e vissuto secondo le leggi, avrebbero trovato così la panacea, come la definiva lei, per tutti i loro mali. Non sprechiamo tempo in inutili rimpianti. Cerchiamo di pensare e fare ciò che lei avrebbe desiderato in queste circostanze e ringraziamo perché è stata liberata dalla sofferenza. Un raggio di luce nella nostra oscurità. Se non fosse stata convinta che c'era nella società chi era in grado di continuare il suo lavoro, ella non ci avrebbe lasciati. Non ci sarebbe stato lutto o i soliti rituali funebri, cosa che potrebbe sorprendere quelli al di fuori che non capiscono ancora lo spirito che anima i teosofi, che il corpo è un semplice indumento e la morte è semplicemente un cambiamento. Quando la fiamma artificiale, fredda, del materialismo moderno si spegne per mancanza di combustibile, coloro per i quali la speranza di un'esistenza oltre la tomba è un tormento, dovrebbero prepararsi alla più grande delusione che si possa provare, poiché dalle acque scure, profonde e fangose della materia sta sorgendo una forza mistica. Non è che il primo fruscio, ma è un fruscio sovrumano, è soprannaturale solo per i superstiziosi e gli ignoranti. Lo spirito della verità sta ora passando sulla superficie delle scure acque e andandosene li costringe a rivelare i loro tesori spirituali. E questo spirito è una forza che non può essere ostacolata e mai 
mai essere fermati.